Koto, and he says, who does the ministry grant licenses for prospecting in the forest reserves in the first place? If they do not intend to grant a license for mining, okay, if it is a forest reserve, such activity should not be permitted. Uh, Brian Brown says, Mr. Nemako is trying to assure us that the current minister, Mr. Jinapo, will do something better. But he shouldn't forget that it is with this same vibrancy that Mr. Amewu started the fight. But still, here we are. Uh, Babamu in Tamale says, congratulations to all deputy minister designates. Anyway, better luck to the rest of uh, the persons who couldn't make it, but the appointees of the president uh, should remember we have four years to govern. Uh, four years to govern. Then, uh, Man, Man Friday, is that your name? Says that the hard truth is that Ghana might not see any rapid development just as it has been. Nothing seems to change no matter who is appointed. The problems are still the same as before. Eliasu in Tamale says the deputy minister nominees must uh, live up to, must live up to expectation by justifying their inclusion. They must adopt an open door policy to those whose efforts <laughs> brought them uh, to that elevation. That's a party person talking. Open door so that they can reach you. They must be mindful of the elections ahead of us by making the president proud. Kweku Abeku says, I think, um, I think uh, you are going through the normal misunderstanding that parties experience when they lose elections. I think NDC is going through the normal misunderstanding. Abdallah Redwan says in politics like religion, power lay in uh, certainty. And that one man's certainty always threatened another. I'm not sure I get that. Einstein, uh, Adrian Nyanyansa, Adrian Nyanyansa says, intra-party politics is a lot more acrimonious than inter-party politics. It's always unwise to seek to make political capital out of one party's internal issues. Uh, Jama were Jama Woyale, uh, okay, in Boku, you says that the Galamse menace got worse simply because of the NPP mentality of party Hyansika. We should cut the pretense and speak truth to power. And finally, Muhammad uh, Sita, you say, if a political party is able to groom young men to insult its opponents, where else do you want uh, to look? If uh, you want the source of that behavior. I think there is a disconnect between the party elders and the functional executives of the party. And there are many of you who are concerned that we shouldn't be discussing NDC party uh, issues because it is uh, your private matter. A political party is not a private entity. According to the laws of Ghana, it's a public entity. Right, thank you. This show is brought to you by Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner. MTN everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Way lead properties. Home is where one starts from. Heaven mosquito spray and coil. Pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects. And Napa food, it is tasty. DBS Industries, we truly are your roof experts. Robert and Sons Limited Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care services provider. Right, so um, let me begin with uh, Suleimana once again. Uh, we don't have uh, Kojo Kwankrumah joining us yet. Do we have him now? Okay, so Suleimana, the issue about bringing in the broadcasting bill, uh, what's, what's the need? Why are we here now? The broadcasting bill, after all, has been in the works for almost a decade or more now. Why are we now bringing it back? Well, um, Samson, I think it's something that we have always needed. It's something that ought to have been in place long ago. 
Uh, I know we don't have much time and I will try to be as quick as possible with my submission. Yeah. But you know, when the constitution came into force on January 7, 1993, it was about two or three months after, there was a conference convened at Gimpa. And this was a, a, a national conference on um, um, independent broadcasting. And uh, then uh, the Professor P.A.V. Ansan, Professor Kwame Kakari, and other stalwarts in the industry, you know, brought together people of diverse backgrounds, including lawyers and engineers and so on and so forth, to deliberate what we do. And if you look at the proceedings from that conference, the late Justice D.K. Afre, for example, writing about how do we regulate the industry, makes the point that, well, we are coming from a culture of silence, and therefore it is understandable that the framers of the Constitution would provide that kind of space for media freedom. However, it is important that we regulate the industry in order to avoid what he called chaos. And in so in so, he recommended that the NMC and, the, and Parliament had a responsibility to ensure that what the Constitution requires of all of us under Article 164 is immediately responded to. And as you know, that article talks about the fact that we need to make the appropriate legislation in order to address concerns about public morality, public order, the rights of other persons, and so on and so forth. Now, 28 years on, nothing was really done, except you know, um, having the draft in place and then doing all the back and forth and so on and so forth. I've heard from um, credible and authoritative people saying that, look, the broadcasting bill got stuck because industry players, particularly GABA, had concerns about certain provisions, and so they really fought against its passage. Now, we've come to a point where we realize that perhaps we would have, our collective interest would have been served if we had the broadcasting uh, bill in place, or a law to regulate the broadcast um, um, space in place. And I believe that if anything at all, the incident in Kasua may have triggered our energies and gotten all of us to suddenly realize that we cannot wait anymore uh, to have a law to regulate the broadcasting space. We started off with um, just one or two stations. We are talking now about over 450 radio stations, more than 100 television channels, and we know about dozens that are broadcasting on the internet and so on and so forth. And it is, it is really surprising if you think of it that all these things were happening without a legislation in place. And if you look at the, the ruling of um, Justice Benin in the Giba versus Attorney General and NMC, even as the Supreme Court took the view that what the NMC wanted to do was at variance with the Constitution, particularly the guarantees around media freedom and no censorship and so on and so forth. They make it emphatic that the framers of the Constitution did not contemplate a, tra a transition from the culture of silence to a culture of media impunity. And they make the point that if we were to allow media impunity to thrive, the results will be chaos, the results will be disorder. And I have always said or held a view that an unregulated media space that allows for anything to go is perhaps the most dangerous thing for our press freedom. So in order for us to preserve the freedoms that the Constitution guarantees for us, the right thing that we must do is to have a legislation in place, except to add that whatever legislation that we decide to put in place must be one that does not in any way attempt to take away parts or in full the freedoms that are guaranteed for our media um, to practice and to thrive. I don't know of any democratic, you know, serious democracy where, you know, because the media must be free, there's no regulation. If you go to the UK, and those of you who are lawyers, you often say we practice common law. And I believe that the origins of common law perhaps is the UK. The UK, the Ofcom, which is the media regulator, is perhaps one of the strongest media regulators in the world. And they make sure that every media organizations are taking on. And, and sometimes heavy sanctions are imposed. So we are at a time when we cannot just allow the media industry to operate without any regulation. And reference to the Constitution talks about freedoms, 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 which we have ensured. 
But where it talks about having appropriate legislation in order to deal with the freedoms and make sure that we have order um, and avoid chaos, then we say because of freedoms, we are not responding to it. I think it is time for us to deal with Article 164 uh, and empower the National Media Commission to do what it has to do, which it has not been doing over the years. Uh, would you not agree that you, as in Geba, the GJA and media watchdogs like you, you may have failed. And that is why you seem to believe that this is important and this is what we ought to have. I'm sure you are familiar with Freedom House, international uh, media watchdog. And it did, you know, some assessment and clearly says, let me read to you, that self-regulation as an alternative to statutory, reg statutory regulation is acknowledged as the best practice model and is already used in dozens of countries, particularly those with freer media environment. In a self-regulatory -regul system, the media industry essentially polices itself through bodies such as non-governmental media council or an ombudsman which monitor compliance with agreed upon code of conduct. Most self-regulatory bodies apply to the print media, but in some countries, there are separate entities for broadcast media. Councils that, are, that uh, cover all forms of media are less common, but given the growth of media houses that encompass print, broadcast, and internet outlet, this all media format may expand in future. So well, uh, is there not a failure in this direction that you should have led these processes for a self-regulatory process rather than a state regulatory process? Well, something quickly. Yes, I know uh, Freedom House. In fact, for a number of years, I was one of their reviewers for their global uh, freedom of the press index. Now, the point they make uh, is, is valid, but uh, somehow misleading. So where we have self-regulatory mechanisms, it does not mean that statutory regulate, regulations shouldn't exist. So if you take a country like Benin, they have a, self a very efficient self-regulatory body called ODEM. And ODEM is actually supported by even the state to ensure that the media is self-regulated I mean, uh, among themselves. But that does not mean that the country does not have an overarching law such that when the self-regulatory mechanism fails, then the statutory regulation will be triggered. It is the same if you go to Cote d'Ivoire. It's the same in Niger. But I should say that among the Francophone countries in West Africa, we have strong self-regulatory mechanisms. But at the same time, the statutory bodies exist, which can crack the whip when it has to do that. Um, Freedom House is based in the US. In the US, it has a statutory media regulatory body uh, even though they talk about, you know, all the freedoms that are, that, that are in place. So you cannot say that in the U.S. it is free for all, anything goes. There is regulation in place. If you go to the U.K., as I said, the Ofcom exists, one of the strongest. Yes, there are some regulatory mechanisms, but at the same time, statutory regulation is very important. So we could have done better in terms of self-regulation in Ghana, but even if we were doing better, I think that it is so critical that we have a statutory regulation that would empower bodies like the National Media Commission to be able to act where self-regulation appears to be failing. Interesting. Uh, let me bring in Professor Abochi here. And the, the same, uh, you know, as it were, Media Watchdog internationally uh, suggests that legislation establishing an official regulatory body would ideally ensure its independence from the political branches of government, political parties, and economic interests. This means insulating the regulator from improper influence over its membership, appointment, financing, and decision-making process. However, these laws can also be crafted in a way that both limits the regulatory body's autonomy from the outset and grant it such authority that the government can use it to ensure official control over important parts 
of the media landscape. Is it not the fear? And we live in a, uh, the part of the world and in a country where we know that when these things are done, the people who are appointed, the manner of appointment, they behove to the political you know, uh, elites. And therefore, it becomes difficult to have an independent, impartial process. Isn't that the fear? Any executive body that is established will invariably spark that fear. Ours is a history of censorship. We've come from an era when the executive authority of state basically predetermined what was going to be published. Having moved away from that, but really not having moved away in some ways, there is always the fear that an executive authority, an agency of state that is given the mandate will invariably be subject to manipulations by the executive authority. So that fear cannot be wished away. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how we can go around that. Ideally, the National Media Commission could have been structured, could have been in some ways encouraged to, to do this. And I think the Media Commission somehow, sometimes, um, appears to constrict its own authority. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to take you know, what I would consider its appropriate authority. It rather interprets its powers in a very narrow way and in some ways constricts its own authority. I think that the Constitution gives the Media Commission, well, not I think, it's the reality. The Constitution gives the Media Commission the authority to set standards. There is nothing broader than that authority. Certain standards require that you put in place mechanisms that weeds away things that violate those standards. So the Media Commission has an invariable authority, which in my opinion they have somehow, you know, rather self-narrowed their own authority in terms of how they exercise that power, and that remains a problem. But it's imperative for us to also put this in context and to recognize the fact that the standard setting authority of the National Media Commission, when exercised, can be a bit more acceptable in terms of broad-based you know, acceptance. And I say this because the Media Commission has done well fairly, or fairly done well, since its establishment to insulate itself from political accusations. Or so generally, the media, the media commission has played that nonpartisan, um, nonpartisan regulatory role. And my thinking is, if it's up, if it's empowered, it can actually play this role effectively and easily without the accusation that comes with um, an executive authority, an executive agency mm. um, being under the control of the executive authority. But I'll quickly just hasten to make the point about the the decision affecting the the um the, the Giba case yeah. look the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is this in the absence of guidelines in the absence of a clear detailed and rational criteria for pre-evaluating content in the absence of a clear statement of these the supreme court will arrive at the decision it arrived at and the reason this is is because the Supreme Court, clearly mindful of the history of censorship and mindful of the Constitution's prohibition of censorship, any pre-evaluation of content which is not accompanied by clear objective criteria of how the allowances and disallowances of content will be gone about, of how the prohibition or otherwise will be gone about, and leaves a lot of these in the spectrum or realm of speculation in the spectrum or realm of discretionary authority, the Supreme Court will strike the legislation down. And that will be absolutely correct. And the reason that is correct is because the Supreme Court's position or concern will be that a pre-evaluation of content, which is not accompanied by a predetermined standard for doing that, so that there's no fear of interferences, as you mentioned, so that there's no fear of biases, and there's no fear of arbitrariness from, point, from time to time then you are clearly in the, in the realm of uh, censorship, which is prohibited. So we can have this done again and properly done, but the prohibition or the allowances or disallowances of content must be clearly spelled out. Virtually nothing will be left to discretion so that when a, when a content is allowed or disallowed, everyone knows that the standard criteria for doing that has been respected and you can, you can, you can verify um, in case you have complaints. And of course, it must also be hinged on some appeal or appellate system so that if someone disagrees with the decision, what are the appellate systems and how do we go about these things? So there, there's a way of doing it, and I think okay. the way was so, going about So like, I, like I mentioned earlier, we will definitely need um, a proper platform dedicated to this subject matter. But let me have Suini also come in. And 
I have no better reference than Freedom House. So let me read one portion of Freedom House's work that they have done in a number of countries, including African countries. And they say that uh, most countries, including democratic states, have traditionally featured significant regulation of private broadcast outlets, typically including licensing and frequency allocation by an official regulatory body, ideally an independent non-partisan entity adjudicates request for licenses we don't have that in in our country an independent non-partisan entity adjudicates request for the licenses and spectrum according to a clearly defined legal process and in transparent in a transparent and unbiased manner so that media diversity is not compromised regulatory bodies following this model are common in north america western europe as well as in a number of other democratic settings. For example, in Mali, while the law requires broadcasters to be licensed in order to receive a frequency and operate, the rules are straightforward. Bureaucratic procedures and financial hurdles are minimal, and the regulatory body in charge of functions in charge functions independently. Well, Samson, I agree with you that um, we will need some more time to have uh, a proper discussion mm. uh, of this topic. And I also agree with you that there's no better reference uh, than uh, Freedom House. They have done extensive work over the years mm. on media fr freedoms across the, the world. I do not know the particular report that you are referring to, but one that uh, I have also uh, come to fall in love is a 2011 report mm. that was entitled uh, License to Censor. That's the one I'm referring to. Yeah, the mm. uh, use of regulation to, you know, uh, restrict, restrict media freedom. freedoms. Mm. I mean, a beautiful, you know, piece that can guide uh, our understanding of, of, of this topic. Now, in the opening of, of this report, it also highlights the fact that over the years, um, um, governments have used brute force and hostile approaches to um, uh, stifling media freedoms. Uh, but uh, because of international condemnation, strong international condemnation, uh, governments all over the world, including democratic governments, are beginning to use a subtle means of still regulating uh, media. And you realize that there have been concerns in this country, uh, especially relating to media freedoms and the fear that we may just be going back to the culture of silence. I have always said that uh, a, a better appreciation of this report uh, will give you a better understanding of the concerns as they relate to Ghana and the, 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 the subtle, you know, uh, 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 chipping away of media freedoms uh, as I see them. But you, if you recall, when the information minister appeared before the appointments committee, that was an issue I raised with him, the need for us to get the broadcasting bill uh, uh, passed. Because really, I fail to understand why all these years we have not been able to get it passed. I looked at the memorandum, for example, that accompanied the 2014 uh, bill that came to parliament. And clearly, uh, there is an identif identification of the fact that all over the world, I mean, international be best practice is that you use program content, you know, as criterion for authorization, uh, which is unfortunately missing in almost all the different pieces of legislation that we have governing broadcasting in this country. Mm. Now, you just made reference to a license regime uh, in a country, Mali. I, Mali. Mm. In Ghana, fortunately for us, under uh, uh, Chapter 12, clearly you do not require a license uh, to, 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 to practice. But under 164, there's something interesting. You are the lawyers. And for me, I think that it's important that we all avert our minds to, 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 to that provision and see whether what is currently happening cannot be addressed and the fear of us going back to the culture of silence also addressed if we have, you know, a broad consensus on the passage of a broadcasting bill that will give clear guidelines as to how the media should operate. Now, 164 says the provisions of Articles 162 and 163 of this constitution are subject to laws that are reasonably required in the interest of national security, public order, 
public morality and for the purpose of protecting the reputations, rights, and freedoms of other persons. Now, it clearly identifies the, 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 the nature of the laws, in my view. That's my understanding of it. Mm. The, the law that should govern even media practice right. should come in this form. Mm. It should be about a threat to national security. It should be about public but, order. But even those matters, yes. the, the experts will tell you in this yeah. area will tell you that these kind of they are sort of vague provisions yes. about public morality and yeah. the rest of them. Yeah. And you normally give the regulator yeah. such wide, it gives the regulator such wide discretion yeah. that it can abuse. Yeah. And therefore, if there has to be regulation, you have to watch these things. Yeah. As we all agree, we have run out of time. Unfortunately. Um, I'm told that the information minister has joined us. Unfortunately, our time is up. <laughs> so what we'll do is that you guys go back, uh, refresh on the bill itself. Yeah. And when we take the bill, I'll invite you to look at from uh, sections 20 up to about uh, 70, 80 thereabout. Then we can 20, pay attention 80. and discuss all, right. all of that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is where we draw the curtains on news file. Hopefully at another date, we'll be able to discuss this matter thoroughly. And uh, our apologies to the minister, Koyopo Nkrumah, I understand he just joined us, but our time is up. Have a good afternoon.